I have to tell you, for a couple of weeks now, I've really been quite proud of myself, because when we got together to talk about this workshop, Francis said, well, Alan, why don't you take the last talk? And I thought, that's fantastic. What better than to have your boss say, he wants you to back clean up? I thought, you know, I have a lot of pride. I just looked at the agenda, and counting the two times that Francis had himself back, which is a different issue, it turns out I'm not the clean up batter. I'm the ninth position in the batting order, so that <laughs> probably more correctly. Uh, and I hope by the end of the, the talk, maybe you won't realize that. Um, so what I'm really talking about is how wonderful it is that we have these GWAS studies, but in fact, how do we translate those into something to improve diagnostics, therapeutics, and particularly in some ways prevention? So there are sort of two major points here. The first is the use of genetic information regarding common disease to individualize providers' approach to patients and to also change patients' behaviors in ways that lead to improved health, so-called personalized medicine in many ways. The second is the use of genetic information regarding common disease to understand the biology of human disease to, to lead to improved diagnostic, therapeutic, and preventive approaches. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that second one because the whole personalized, for several reasons, including the personalized medicine is probably a three-day seminar rather than a 20-minute talk. But I will, at times, bring in a little bit of this. Now, of course, we spent the whole day talking about GWAS, and uh, most of us uh, who spent time in genetics, either um, practicing uh, medical genetics or trying to write about it, have spent time thinking about uh, single gene disorders. And now, what is this about genetics and common disease? And it's really been the theme for the day. We're moving from thinking about the large effects of single genes and the rarer single gene, so-called single gene diseases, and I put those in parentheses because there's probably no disease that only one gene really has an, has an effect on, to the smaller effects of multiple genes in common complex diseases. Now, one way to sort of just sort of uh, make a quick, I, you know, distinction in your mind between these two kinds of situations, I thought, was to uh, talk about a typical single gene disorder, and several have already been mentioned today, but um, since, uh, you know, I come from the NIH, I thought I should be erudite and quote the literature, reference the literature for you, so I've, I've referenced my favorite, I hate to pick favorites here, um, but I have referenced my favorite journal here. Um, and those of you who buy your own groceries undoubtedly at least read this journal, I, I'd like to, if any of you write for this journal sometimes, I'd love to meet you. This is from the Weekly World News. I take particular pride in this because I was the only medical geneticist in Vermont at the time that this appeared. Creature captured live in Vermont, bat with a human face, he's smart as a whip, says stunned scientist. Um, I should know, I'm not, even though I wasn't the only medical geneticist, and though I'm often stunned, I'm not the stunned scientist who was quoted here. Though it would be great to have this on my CV if it had been me. Uh, but this was a kind of the old you know, model of a single gene disorder, some strange uh, uh, conglomeration of physical findings, et cetera, that led to uh, a, uh, a diagnosis uh, usually carrying some triple epidemic name and, uh, you know, with three people in the, in the world who have had it. Now, obviously, there's single gene disorders that are much more uh, common than three in the world, and some of them are quite important for health. But in general, single gene disorders are rare enough that they um, rarely approach a kind of public health concern. And that's why when we start thinking about the impact of GWAS studies on health, there really is a somewhat different impact than even the total impact of single gene disorders. Because when we start talking about GWAS, we're really talking about all these disorders. Um, you will notice, uh, I think, the first page of the handout for my talk starts with a variant of this slide. I tried to put my uh, time to good use uh, during the break this morning and actually updated the slide that you have from 2002 to 2004. You'll notice it's sort of interesting. The only thing that changes uh, between those two years is that, is that diabetes and Alzheimer's have flipped uh, places um, in terms of, excuse me, Alzheimer's and pneumonia influenza have flipped places in terms of the order of things, both as Alzheimer's becomes a more common cause of death and pneumonia influenza becomes slightly less common. But essentially, if you do it any year of the last uh, number of years, you'd have the same list of 10 disorders. What they all have in common, of course, is that by, by the very definition, of course, they're common disorders. And that in terms of what we've known about the genetics, all we've really known until quite recently is, gee, if you have a family history of one of these, you should be concerned you have an increased risk of developing this, perhaps dying from it, et cetera. But we have not been able, um, prior to the GWAS kind of era, to identify for most of these, cancer being the one exception where we really have been able to identify a number of specific genes involved, 
because of the very nature of all cancers being genetic, not all hereditary, of course, it's made it easier to find genes involved in cancers. The one on this list that gets a question mark is injury. Many people would argue, gee, injury, that is by its nature an accident, as it's often called incorrectly. And so genes must not play a role there. Of course, there is a genetic variant that we've known for some time. You don't need a GWAS study to find this genetic variant that makes one much more likely to die of injury than other individuals. And as an experienced clinician, I can tell you just looking around the room that I can spot a number of people that have this genetic variant. So without appropriate informed consent, I'm about to tell you a number of you that you're more likely to die of injury than others in this room. And that genetic variant, of course, is the Y chromosome. If you happen to have the copy of the Y chromosome, you're much more likely to die of injury than if you lack it. But that may not be truly biologic, which is why that gets a question mark. But it's an important thing to realize, and one of the real reasons for showing this slide, is that regardless of whether genes play a role in the likelihood of your developing an injury, though in fact they probably do, they clearly do play a role in what happens once you get the injury. And that's not just peculiar injury. It's also true of all the disorders in the slide. We often think about genes in causing disease, but clearly, particularly when we're talking about, or specifically when we're talking about common diseases, genetic variants have much to do with how the individual host handles the disease as well as the therapies we use for the disease once they get it. So if you look at several different people with the same injury, who ends up developing acute respiratory distress syndrome in the ICU and who doesn't, well, lots of factors can contribute to that. But we're beginning to be able to identify genes, in fact, that play a role in those kinds of things. So if we're in the era of genomic medicine, using the whole genome to understand health, gee, can't we just have a good GWAS study today and have a new drug tomorrow? After all, last week, genes involved in diabetes, how come there's not a new drug for you to write about by now? It's been several days, after all. Well, the problem is that there are all these steps. And basically, what I'd like to do is to walk you through this diagram. I'll go through some of it in a little more detail than others. But basically, showing the flow from GWAS down to both, well, prevention, diagnostics, and therapeutics, all three of them, just sort of talk with you a bit about each of the steps involved here and why there are both problems here. But while there are problems, there are reasons to have optimism about these various pathways and that we actually will be able to get through them. So the first one, replicate and validate, well, people have already talked about that, several speakers today, so I really don't need to go into that one anymore. The next step, I'm going to try to keep highlighting these in yellow, identify genes and gene products. Once you replicate and validate the GWAS study, you clearly need to not just, as we've talked about again, not just have the region in mind, but you've got to identify the genes or gene products that are responsible for this, for the etiology of the disorder to be able to really get anywhere. A good example of that is the story that many of you will know now a couple of years old. They're using a GWAS approach, both originally in this study and then in a couple of others afterwards, which among them have been able to identify three different genes, which account for approximately 74 percent of the attributable risk of age-related macular degeneration, which depends on how you define things as either the leading or the second cause of significant vision loss in the elderly in the U.S. And that's interesting because before that study, of course, no one would have referred or thought of AMD particularly as a genetic disorder. It was a disorder that was pretty common. We thought, gee, if you had family members that had it, you were at somewhat increased risk for it, but it wasn't a dramatically increased risk. Now, once you've identified the gene or gene product, we'll go down the center aisle here, talk about developing a diagnostic test. And, of course, the test methodology is going to vary incredibly depending upon exactly what the gene or protein product perhaps you're looking at. So, you know, you can use your imagination. You can run wild in terms of the various technologies and methodologies that one might do to do that. Now, it's important to realize that, however, whatever the technology is, methodology you're going to use to develop the diagnostic test, that's only going to happen if someone financially supports the development of the test. Sometimes that comes from the NIH through research dollars. Sometimes it comes from private industry. Particularly, of course, private sector support tends to depend upon the 
at least the perception that there's a market for the test. But this is a real issue, how you go first developing the test and then moving it from the research to the clinical arena, and particularly that move from the research to clinical arena, because even if you have a well-developed methodology, et cetera, et cetera, there are very few clinical labs that perform tests just because they can. They tend to perform tests because you're going to get payment for doing so. So there are all kinds of issues about health economics and other kinds of things mixed up in here. So there are multiple steps, really, to developing the diagnostic test, and it's not just a question of technology or scientific approach. In terms of once one has the test, you actually need to show that the test, well, I'll go through all these terms with you, that the test really is valid, first of all, the analytic validity, that the test does what you really expect it to do. But even if you have a test with good analytic validity, that does not necessarily mean it's of any use in health care. So you need to show both the clinical validity and, in some ways, most difficultly, I suppose, but perhaps most importantly, the clinical utility of the test. That's not to say that there aren't lots of genetic tests out there, and more broadly, lots of other medical tests that aren't genetic at all, for which clinical utility has never been demonstrated, and which, in fact, if you did a rigorous study, you probably would not be able to demonstrate true clinical utility. They are used, and sometimes they're useful and sometimes they're not. It's interesting, as we get to sort of genetic testing, this is a standard that, in general, is being utilized to think about new genetic tests, et cetera. We haven't very much retrospectively demanded all three of these for existing medical tests that have nothing to do with genetics itself. But it's a good sort of rubric, I think, to think about as you think about testing for not just genetic disease, but any disease, whether it be gene-based or not. And then, of course, even if you go through all those steps, you really have to obtain third-party payer coverage for the test. Because if you can't cover the lab cost, then not very many health care providers are going to order the test. And even if a health care provider might suggest to a patient, very few patients, though some would, very few patients are going to utilize the test unless their third-party payer covers the cost of the test. Another part of this is actually covering the health care provider time involved in the testing, which can be significant, particularly with newer genetic tests that haven't been used routinely in medicine. It would take a lot of explanation often or discussion between the health care provider and the patient. And, of course, we have a health care system that tends not to reward providers for time spent simply talking to a patient. So there are a number of financial hurdles here. Sometimes you can get around the need to cover health professional time specifically in terms of a test, but you certainly need to be able to pay the lab in some manner if you're going to have the test reach wide use. So going down the other arm here that has to do with developing therapeutics, you really need to define the function of the gene or the gene product if you're going to get very far with that. So here, Nick Wade, I don't think, is here today, but here's his story from last week about the diabetes genes findings. And part of the story says, quote, the importance of the new genes is that they point to previously unknown pathways involved in diabetes. Several of the new variant genes make the pancreatic beta cells produce less insulin, Dr. Altshuler said. That suggests that diabetes may start as a disease of too little insulin production, even though patients turn up in the doctor's office making too much insulin to which their tissues have become resistant. Well, of course, speculating upon the function of a gene in the New York Times does not necessarily make it true, though lots of readers probably think so, and I'm sure you're aware of the power of your pens when you write these things. But clearly that's an important point, that already David Altshuler and others involved in this are trying to figure out what is the function of the genes implicated, because it's by understanding the function that you're really going to get somewhere. So even if you understand the function, what do you need to do next? Well, based upon your understanding of the function, you need to identify a drug target. And this gets a lot of attention in the biotech press, amongst other places. That's an example of it. Of course, you can use more or less conventional strategies once you have found a new drug target, develop a new drug. 
uh, again, you need to uh, have the idea that there's going to be a market there. Most drug development is done in the private sector, and so there needs to be a feeling among some part of the private sector anyway that, a, that there is a market for it. One thing to talk about, which I'm just going to sort of throw this in as a parenthetical, interesting, I think important fact, when we talk about whether it be genome-wide association studies or some other things that are happening in genomics, it's important to stress that a lot of the new drugs we're talking about aren't simply as old new drugs tend to be tweaking something. So, you know, you add a hydroxyl group here, or you take away a methyl group to get better, you know, coverage or better transmission across the blood-brain barrier or something. We're talking about completely new categories of drugs for a number of these diseases. The interesting way I think to think about it is that if we say that we humans have someplace roughly around 20,000 genes, well, maybe not all of them are going to turn out to be good drug targets. They may not all be druggable, quote, unquote. If one guesses, and it's still guess at this point, that perhaps half the human genome presents druggable targets, the genes or the, or the proteins they produce, probably about 10,000 genes. Currently, if we look at all the drugs in the pharmacopoeia, they target about 500 genes in their products. So that would argue that 95 percent of potential sort of drug space is unoccupied at present. So that by understanding, again, the way that genes work in disease, it may be to understand mechanisms of disease in ways differently than we have before. So that, for instance, if we go back to the story about uh, adult onset macular degeneration, the genes that have been shown to have this large role in attributable risk are involved in inflammation, it appears. So that has led to very interesting thoughts about, gee, maybe we should try using drugs that attack the inflammatory pathway. Now, they could be old drugs that we've had to do with inflammation, or one would hope eventually by understanding the precise mechanisms here, perhaps some newly designed drugs to be very specific in terms of, of their effects. But a lot of this, again, is understanding the basic biology through, through our knowledge of genetics. So how would you design a candidate drug once you've identified a drug target? Well, there are lots of ways to do them. Um, one of the things in terms of the genomics approach to particularly try to occupy this other 95 percent of the drug space out there is the idea of this, the use of so-called chemical genomics. Um, the NIH has a chemical genomics center, which is shown there. It's part of a larger initiative, uh, the Molecular Libraries uh, Network. Um, which uh, has been started by the NIH, which has multiple components to it, including lots of extramural labs, um, ways uh, something called PubChem, where the results are shared, et cetera, et cetera. The idea is to use high-throughput screens to understand both the action of genes that are newly discovered, but also, very importantly, to uh, make a huge difference in terms of developing some new candidate drugs. Now, of course, even if you do that, you've got to do clinical trials to show that the drug is safe and that it's efficacious, and you've got to get a FDA approval. So this is in your handout. It's just a, a diagram courtesy of Chris Austin, who runs the NIH uh, Chemical Genomics Center, showing basically um, with some approximate time horizons for you there, the stages of drug development um, with basic biomedical research, which has a very indefinite uh, time frame to it. Um, and then this molecular not libraries initiative that I mentioned goes a little further in that, and there are other efforts in the public sector to do that, but this is probably the largest one to move a little closer, a little farther down the field in terms of achieving the ultimate goal of actually having a new drug. But there's still many steps beyond that. So if you're talking about GWAS leading to a completely new drug, then you have multiple steps that need to be taken, and it will take some years, and it's important for both you, obviously, and your readers to understand that. Now, there may be some shortcuts. For instance, if we go back to the AMD story, if it turns out that drugs are already out there, widely prescribed perhaps as anti-inflammatories, if we can do, if someone does a study to show that they are helpful in AMD, then you skip all these other steps of drug development. You can use an old drug that's already been clinically approved by the FDA, et cetera, et cetera. You just need to expand the indications and the labeling. Um, from the FDA, which is a lot easier to do than to go through all these steps and much more likely to uh, both shorter time frame and much more likely to lead to success. But if you're talking about starting de novo, really, a completely new drug, then you can shortcut some of these steps, but it's still a matter of some years until you're going to see a completely new drug. So looking at our other pathway, the prevention pathway, 
you can see here you might well come from diagnostic tests. And once you have the diagnostic test, you could offer that to lots of people and think about prevention strategies. So that, for instance, uh, adult onset and, um, macular degeneration, you could think about developing a diagnostic test based upon these genes that we've shown uh, are, are implicating in the disease etiology, and you could, in, you could diagnose people in the population as being at significantly increased risk for this. And then, for instance, you could simply work counseling with those folks about smoking behavior, for instance. It turns out that the attributable risk if you add smoking in much increases your risk if, you're, if you have one of these at-risk alleles. So those kinds of prevention strategies based upon the diagnostic test are one way to go. But in fact, for some of these, you don't even have to, to uh, de develop the diagnostic test. Um, you can simply, if you can replicate and validate the GWAS study, et cetera, et cetera, you can occasionally uh, go without the test, but simply be able to devise prevention and non-drug strategies that would be of use even without the a diagnostic test leading into it. Now, this is an interesting article from JAMA uh, not very long ago, which again talks about AMD. I'm going to concentrate on the part in yellow, but I think the part in white is actually interesting just in terms of uh, well-done science, in terms of the, the folks writing the article saying, wait a minute here. Uh, we believe it is premature at this time to consider genotyping individuals with various stages of AMD. Screening should consider, one, the genotyping of about 30 individuals with, with Drusen pigment changes, that's um, sort of a sign of AMD, uh, would be required to identify one individual who is homozygous for the risk allele for both genes. And two, the observation that many but not all individuals with those genotypes will develop the disease. So they're saying, wait a minute before you develop some kind of test and try to market it broadly here, let's look a little bit, basically, even though they're not using the terms, they're talking about let's look at the clinical validity and clinical utility before we just start doing this test because we can. However, in the future, a risk profile that includes genetic and environmental factors such as the one calculated herein may ultimately lead to targeted screening and closer monitoring of individuals who are at higher risk of visual loss due to AMD progression. And that's clearly something that many people in the public health community are beginning to think about, that once we show um, genes that are implicated in disease causation, to think about finding individuals who have variants that make them more likely to develop disease and develop targeted preventive um, strategies to try to help those, those individuals, which of course are all of us for one disease or another, or for many of us for multiple diseases. But even if you've done that, you have to validate these things via outcome studies. Uh, and uh, the idea there is that, you know, you might have a test that looks good, et cetera, et cetera, but unless we really do rigorous outcome studies to show that making the behavior change, et cetera, have a positive impact on eventual health status, sort of so what? Now, again, lots of things in medicine we've done over the years without showing that they really have a positive impact on health status. But the idea here is we shouldn't just do this blindly. It's going to take some time if you think about all the steps here. Even if we were had this prevention strategy in place today, it would take some time to do a good study that shows by counseling you about your individual risk, let's say for AMD, and then counseling you about the particularly injurious effects of smoking for you. Does that really change? I mean, there are lots of people today who smoke who already know that smoking is not such a great idea for them. By adding in their personal risk for AMD, is that really going to change their behavior or not? We don't know, and we don't know how you might do the counseling in order to, to be able to achieve that. So those are the kinds of things that still clearly need to be figured out. But even if we do all that, will we really make an impact on health? So I think to, do, to make this work, it's going to require both informed, interested providers and informed, interested public, that is us. Um, and we thank you for your help in accomplishing both of those things, actually. So there are many ways to talk about this. One particular um, sort of resource, I guess, and tool to mention to you if you're not already aware of it in terms of reaching healthcare providers or something which has now been around for over a decade called the National Coalition for Health Professional Education in Genetics. Uh, the name may be the only thing that's more unwieldy than the acronym of NICHPEG. Um, but NICHPEG is an, organiz an umbrella organization that includes literally dozens, scores actually, of uh, health professional organizations, everything from hospital chaplains to um, physician assistants to lots of nursing organizations, a lot of medical specialty groups, et cetera, 
that's in many ways uh, sort of serving as a clearinghouse and a catalyst for health professional education in genetics, and particularly some of these newer things. And then, of course, informed interest of public, there are multiple ways to try to achieve that. Um, you know, we tend to uh, look at you as perhaps the major way to do that. We know that you often do not feel that your job is to do our job for us to educate the public. Um, but we like to think on good days, I guess it is a partnership, uh, that we can do that together. And uh, even if it's not the prime objective of any of us, somehow we'll still get about doing it. Uh, a specific other tool for this uh, that many of you will know about, but some of you probably won't, is something called the U.S. Surgeon General's Family History Initiative, which was started several years ago by then Surgeon General Carmona, continues uh, even after his leaving that job. And it's a multiple agency in the federal government effort and lots of private uh, non-federal partners at this point to try to encourage use of family history in health care with the idea that way before we get to sophisticated genetic tests, et cetera, family history in some ways is the cheapest and most accessible genetic test that we've got. Precise, not very, but um, cheap and easy to access, yes. So this is an attempt uh, to try to make family history more useful in health care in various kinds of ways that I'd be happy to talk about. So uh, again, just to make the point that uh, while many of us of today's standard medical practice have never been proven to improve health or to make sense economically, we should use rigorous outcome and cost-benefit studies to decide which genomic medicine practices to utilize. Um, I'm sure we'll be using some as we, as we study them, obviously, uh, but that's what we seek to do, to do this in a kind of rational, effective way. So I realized that I need to come up with an executive summary. One of the things I've learned in my eight years within the Capitol Beltway is that nothing is worth knowing unless you can reduce it to one page or less. Something that I know you think you get a few column inches. We do too sometimes. Uh, and so the question is how can you reduce this to one page or less? So I figured the question's easy. I just looked at the title of my talk. Will GWAS actually lead to prevention, diagnostic, and therapeutics for common disease? Wonderful thing about at the NIH, lots of very bright collegial folks. So I went around, can anybody give me a short answer to this? I don't know whether the short part that threw them, but for some reason uh, couldn't, couldn't answer that. Um, so that, uh, you know, I thought some more, gee, there must be some people around here, and I realized this is an executive summary. I am a member of the federal government, so I have an executive. I have a chief executive. So I thought, aha. Executives must know about executive summaries. Perhaps the chief executive would have a nice short answer to this. I see some of you look skeptical. I, I can't believe that. Yeah. Well, sure enough, President Bush on April the 10th, 2002, on a Saturday morning address actually when he was saying something about the need for genetic non-discrimination legislation, he mentioned our age may be known to history as the age of genetic medicine, a time when many of the most feared illnesses were overcome. Well, I thought that's of interest. That's short. It's an executive summary. I have unpublished data that suggests that the reason why executive summaries are so important within the capital beltway are because of uh, variants in genes having to do with attention deficit disorder being much more common around here. But anyway, that will remain unpublished. I thought that's wonderful. And then I realized, well, you know, this is a crowd who may not necessarily believe that everything George Bush says is true. Um, I know that you have no, just that I'm a federal bureaucrat, you remember the press, so you have no more personal political beliefs than I do, clearly. Um, so I thought that might not work, but still, balance. I know that you love balance in your stories, right? You like to have both sides. Ideally, you like to have at least two sides, but you like to have balanced coverage. So I thought, aha, when I first came to D.C., there was another chief executive. He came from the other party. What could be more balanced than that? But what's the chance of two chief executives in a row talking about, you know, this kind of stuff? And then I remembered that, in fact, there was a ceremony at the White House in which Francis was a lead participant, at which then President Clinton announced that the draft human genome had been achieved, human genome sequence. And at that ceremony, sure enough, here's what Clinton said. He said, because of the draft sequence now being available, it is now conceivable that our children's children will know the term cancer only as a constellation of stars. Now, that shows a couple of things. One shows he had a heck of a good speechwriter. <laughs> now, the, yeah, exactly. Now, it also, some people would say, well, boy, that's gene hype. And there's clearly been a lot of gene hype out there. 
And if truth be known, of course, where our children's children, will cancer still exist in a couple of generations? Of course it will still exist. However, I think there's actually some gene hope there more than gene hype. And that is if we look at the family of disorders that we call cancer and we compare those to, say, infectious disease, because many people, I think, more or less correctly say that our knowledge of genetics and genomics in this century will have the kind of impact on health that our knowledge of infectious disease did in the last century. So we compare the family of disorders we call cancer with, say, tuberculosis. I think we'll see a similar kind of evolution in this century for cancers as we did for TB in the last century. That is, cancer will become, as TB has become, no longer something that if you did a rigorous three-generation family history, you would find multiple individuals in the family who, in fact, had had it, several of whom would probably have died from it. Like TB, cancer would become something that people no longer have a legitimate personal fear that, gee, I've got a good chance of developing that during my lifetime. Like tuberculosis, for those relatively rarer individuals who do develop cancer, it will become something which in many instances is curable and in others becomes treatable so that it becomes a chronic disease rather than a cause of death. Now, like tuberculosis, there will still be huge issues about healthcare access, socioeconomic status and other kinds of things that even in the age of genomic medicine will still have a huge impact on health care. Even in the age of genomic medicine, the bad news is we will all, maybe it's the good news actually, we will all still die, but presumably we will, we will live longer and healthier. But I do want to, you know, I want to both say that there is a real, if not pot of gold at the end of this rainbow, there are some real positive impacts that we can discern um, GWAS studies and similar work will lead to, but also at the same time say it will take some time to get there. There are multiple steps. We're at the beginning of a, you know, it is a revolutionary era and all that, but there are logical steps that need to be completed before we truly see the health benefits. Some of, for some diseases, those steps will happen very quickly. For others, they will be frustratingly slow. Um, but it will be an interesting story for all of us. So I'm going to stop there. Um, Sharon Begley from Newsweek. Um, a question about the part of your slide where you show in the flow chart how some of this work might lead to a diagnostic. Would it, will it be important for any such diagnostic test, I guess including those that already exist, to achieve clinical validity and utility for it to determine the, the expression status, the epigenetic status of whatever gene allele you're looking at? It's not going to be important for every test to be able to do that, but there will be some for which simply knowing the gene sequence isn't going to be enough. There'll be some for, you know, knowing that won't, won't tell you much of anything. There are others that will tell you a lot, but not the whole story. Um, to know the, but of course, often in medicine, you don't need to know the whole story to have a positive impact. Ideally, you want to know the whole story and be able to take all that into consideration. So there'll be some situations we, I don't think we really know yet, but there'll be some situation which epigenetic phenomena, like other, all kinds of other things, are very important. There'll be some situations where genetic status alone may not tell you much, but it's going to be the interaction of that specific genetic variant with some very specific environmental intermediary that makes a difference in health. So that even knowing, you know, genetic status in some situations may not tell you much, but if you can you know, connect that to specific, as we learn these specific, something about the specific genetic uh, environmental interactions, it may be knowing that extra piece of information that's going to be important. I mean, while Bob Lang with Forbes, while people, geneticists debate whether, like that paper, whether it's premature to have macular degeneration, other genes available as a test. Isn't someone in Silicon Valley just going to put this stuff up on the web? You'll get your own Illumina 300K hat, hat or whatever, $500, and you'll be able to find out all the things they want, you know, all the things you want, whether or not it's, quote, premature or not. Absolutely. I look very much forward to your story illuminating that dynamic <laughs> and explaining to people how they might be able to discern what's, uh, you know, sort of, I mean, this is a wonderful you know, if we all wanted to go into snake oil sales together, this would be a wonderful 21st century opportunity to do it. There's no question. Um, and uh, on the other hand, if we want to do something that's really wonderful and real benefit to humanity, this is also a wonderful opportunity. So there, there will be, I think, there's clearly, because this is complicated stuff, 
as you all know, the question, you know, the discussion we had during lunch, how do you explain this to people? Well, that's not just of interest to you all. It's very much of interest in a clinical setting, for instance. How do you explain this to people? So it's a situation where, um, you know, people are kind of ripe for the picking, perhaps, for people who either innocently, they may think they're doing something really worthwhile by bringing these tests to everybody, or perhaps not so innocently, just thinking, gee, there's a way to do this. And you can go on the web and find some pretty um, bizarre kinds of offerings. Um, there's lots of claims in terms of nutrigenomics. Um, and is nutrigenomics a real thing? Yes, absolutely. There's something about genomic makeup that interacts with our nutrition to make a difference in who we are. Absolutely. Do we understand that very well yet? Absolutely not. But there are people who are willing to do some, you know, take a swab and then, um, you know, based upon that, do a genetic profile, tell you exactly what kinds of uh, diet you should be on, but particularly what kind of minerals, vitamins, other things you might need to take. And nicely enough, just to make a one-stop shop, I mean, they're willing to sell those to you, actually, um, just to make life easier for you, I'm sure. Uh, so there's a, there's, it's a whole mixed bag out there. I'd be interested in asking you all who, who write about this, as we can anticipate, I think, during the course of this calendar year, uh, the discovery and publication of dozens of gene variants that are clearly correct in terms of showing association with common disease, at what point do you get to the threshold uh, where at least some segment of the general population says, I want to know, I want to see my own report card? Um, if, these, if there are certainly people out there who take preventive medicine very seriously and are looking for whatever information they can find to try to individualize their own plans, at what point does our cautious approach of, well, you know, we really ought to test this out in a research study and make sure we know exactly what the quantitative risk is and prove that there's clinical utility, not just validity in the data. At what point do we get run over uh, by an avalanche of demand of people who simply want to know now? And uh, if we can't tell them that the information's bogus anymore, because it's actually turning out, I think, that we've got real data here, are, are we in a good position to say just Wait a while. What do you think? I just think it depends on how much it will cost. Because I mean, I'm think about the you know different genetic tests for uh, cancers that are out there, and people are getting them. And that's an interesting point. Uh, certainly, the cost of, for instance, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 test, which remains in the thousands of dollars is in part because uh, that's exclusively licensed, so there's no competition. Uh, there's no reason that testing for dozens of SNPs in a given DNA sample should cost more than pennies. I mean, we, we indicated the carton cost of a SNP is about an eighth of a cent, so the actual, actual laboratory costs are going to be quite uh, small. The problem, of course, is there's going to be a big markup by those who are wanting to put this out there as a for-profit enterprise. But if there's some kind of competition in that, that could drive it down. So I don't think we should count on cost being a huge barrier uh, for this kind of broader application. So what's going to happen? I think people also want to know, I, don't, I wouldn't have a test unless I knew there would be something I could do about the problem. I mean, if it's hopeless, why no? I mean, maybe to do your will or something, but, um, you know. <laughs> And there, you know, there are whole social science studies about uh, the people who are information seekers and the people who are not. Uh, you know, we've known for now, gosh, 10 years uh, what the major common risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is, whether you have the APOE4 spelling or not. And yet there's been very little uptake of that information because there's nothing you can do. And it's a pretty horrible idea that you would have this cloud following you around from then on after you've had your genetic test. A lot of the, of the kinds of things, though, that come out in the next uh, few years or this year won't be quite that dark in their implications, but they won't either be connected with a certainty that you can interfere. If you're at higher risk for diabetes or for a heart attack, well, you know, we do things to try to reduce those, like watching your diet and, and exercising. Would that be useful? Even if you couldn't prove right now that your particular gene, genetic predisposition was going to be helped by those, those factors. I, I do think it could be added incentive. I mean, as you said, at most it may increase your risk 20%, but okay, as a chronic dieter that I am, you know, if I knew I had, 
alleles that, you know, would increase my risk of diabetes, hypertension, heart attack. That might, you know, be a good boost. So, Larry, you should tell them about this multiplex project, which is just getting underway, which is attempting to assess this in the real world by offering real people the chance to have this information and see what they do with it. So, Ellen essentially outlined almost a decade's worth of research bringing these tests to their final stages. And in collaboration with the social behavioral branch in our institute, Colleen McBride and I decided we should start down this path. Even though we picked genes last year, we're not going to deal with the flood that's coming out this year. And we will be offering testing for five different chronic diseases, heart disease, a couple different kinds of cancer, osteoporosis, diabetes, to individuals that are covered by the Henry Ford Health System. So they're in a covered HMO-like organization. And this is the really early stage project. We'll be offering this multiplex test where they can find out what their risk is for these complex diseases, some of which were found by whole genome association studies. And our major outcomes and measures are going to be, first of all, do they understand the test? Because this is hard stuff to package. As you guys are struggling how you write about this, this will be hard stuff to package for the general public. And whether or not they find the test useful, what's their attitudes about it, most of the early indications will be, and my behavioral biology people will hit me for talking about this, but I see them really as somewhat marketing issues, not testing the market, but see how people deal with this. Ultimately, we will be able to follow them up long term, while it's a relatively small sample, to see whether or not people who have some of the worst combinations of mutations actually lose weight or go on exercise program. More immediately, we'll be able to see, based on the report card, and these folks are going to get a genetic report card. It's going to come in the mail, a little folder that will tell them how they scored. We'll be able to follow them and see what they avail themselves of in the programs that are available as part of the health system. So there's wellness programs, smoking cessation programs. So our outcome will be, does your genotype make you more likely to go and enroll in one of these programs, or at least inquire to one of these programs? I just, I've always been... No, 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 I mean, he's been using mine all the time. All right, all right. Very articulate. All right, all right, all right. No, no, the thing that... That I, that I still have a little bit of trouble with in all this is what makes genetics so special? I mean, you can listen to WTOP radio, and there's a place up in Rockville that will test you for every known heart problem there is, and some people are running up there to get it, and some people aren't. I mean, is there something special about the kind of information or the increased risk factors that, that the genetic studies are going to give, or is it just because it's less painful and you can just do it with a, a needle stick or a buccal swab or something like that? That's one thing. I, I, I mean, I've thought about this all along. I mean, there are obviously familial implications, but you're not talking about that now necessarily. You're talking about individuals who are going to change their health behavior, right? So. If I can answer before Francis does, because his will be... The short answer is that we don't know whether or not there will be something special about genetics. We, we think there might be, and... Part of it builds upon this foundation where, for better or for worse, we've convinced the public genetics is very important and deterministic. Now we have to back off a little bit and say, well, it's not as deterministic as we were telling you before. There are variants that occur that have little slight increases of risk. But I think the real answer is I'm not sure we know whether genetics will be different or not. And I'm going to also answer for Francis and say, absolutely, we don't know. But it's also the breadth of the information. There's almost no piece of this that's unique, but the breadth of the information as well, the ability once we have enough of this to be able to tell in their genetic report card, not just talk about one disease in terms of your risk, but talk about multiple, multiple diseases. Now, you could say, gee, that's like a whole body scan or something. Well, but most of the whole body scans aren't found in any science. We would hope that this would be. I guess the other thing is that it has the potential, at least, of making these predictions before there is even the tiniest indication of actual pathology. You don't have to have an abnormal body scan outcome 
before the data may give you some information so because genetic information is a permanent it's there it's there as soon as you want to look at it whereas most of the other things we do to sort of make predictions about future risk you already are having a high blood glucose or a high cholesterol or you know you've got degeneration of your spine or you've got a coronary artery that maybe isn't quite doing its thing because you just had a thallium stress test this has the potential of moving the timetable back to an earlier point so that you could begin to practice prevention before you're already sort of half in the grave we used to say that on rounds yeah well it does have these semantic consequences of exactly who's normal anymore especially if we are all recognizing that we have the sort of DNA equivalent of original sin we're all flawed but it's also based on the idea that one could perform interventions to make a difference in terms of outcome not simply saying gee you're not healthy anymore but in fact talk about individualized prevention and other kinds of maybe treatment modalities that would stop you from becoming disease a little discouraged by looking at people who know absolutely for sure positively as you said that smoking is probably not a good thing absolutely so is dieting and so is eating more vegetables and I mean in a way you keep coming back to all the things that you already know that your mother told you you should do anyway and also but so we do have to be a little discouraged but not totally discouraged because for one thing we don't know and this is a big huge question if instead of hearing gee smoking in general is dangerous for you kind of thing if you understood something about particular individual susceptibility and if also if you understood about something and smoking is probably not going to be a good example in fact but something you could do that would make a difference in terms of outcome then then it might be of more value find the allele that prevents you from getting sick from smoking that might tell you something about the biology by which smoking leads to disease you should see about R.J. Reynolds as a partner instead of Pfizer or Novartis and don't you have to also maybe be a little concerned because you're talking about you know looking at alleles that increase your risk of heart disease 20% and people who have a family history of heart disease they don't have the allele then they may think they can get away with not living a healthy lifestyle and part of this again is to I purposely spent much less time talking about the personalized medicine model than I did about the other stuff and again I would argue that by understanding more genes involved in heart disease we're going to repeat the story that we got from familial hypercholesterolemia we'll learn other things about the basic biology that goes to heart attack and obviously can be multiple different biological pathways that all end up the common end too often of heart attack but we'll learn much more about the biology of the disease that will come up with other kinds of things that will make a difference so it's not personalized medicine absolutely important part of this but it's not the whole story going back to the whole personalized medicine and report card thing the thing that I think I would find discouraging and I talked to some other people is this idea that more and more genes are now being implicated so I mean there could turn out to be a hundred genes or you know genomic reason regions that are associated with diabetes or obesity in which case we would all have one or several of them but then what do you do with it sure but it'd be important again not just to know what your total risk is though that may be important but to understand the variants that you have that confer increased risk how do they translate from a variant to disease and maybe there are peculiar things in the steps that lead to diabetes depending upon those risk alleles that require a different kind of thing so maybe you know for one diets will make a difference for another one diet has absolutely no difference whatsoever but in fact for instance let's say that you know your increased risk for diabetes some receptor in some place or other is overexpressed then maybe some new small molecular drug that was specifically designed to sit on that receptor and block it maybe that's what you should be taking instead of worrying so much about exactly how many donuts you're having after lunch zinc yeah I just speaking personally as someone who confronts this as potential news I think there's sort of an analogous question to what consumers will will make of this and that is what what reporters will make of it I was struck in one of these diabetes papers last week this sentence well the eight 
Type 2 diabetes variants discussed in this report each conveys a substantial population attributable risk, 5 to 27 percent at each locus. Each contributes very modestly to overall variance in diabetes risk, 0.04 to 0.5 percent total, 2.3 combined across all eight SNPs. So, you know, I think this, this is actually, you know, was, was an issue last week about what, what does one say about this? You know, it's obviously an incredible scientific accomplishment, but what does it mean? Uh, and, of course, there's always the big push to sort of, you know, speculate on what the medical kind of very utilitarian outcome will be. But I think that both the reporters and the consumers what they're going to make of it really depends on how much magical thinking we're going to invest in, you know, single-digit changes or ex expressions of our risk for, for diseases. And uh, that's why I think this is going to be a hard story to sell even as this tsunami, you know, breaks over us. Maybe I could comment on that, that a bit. Uh, we didn't have time really to talk about population attributable risk and what those measures mean, and they are, you know, fairly complicated um, um, concepts, but they do depend a fair amount on both the size of the risk associated and the prevalence of the variant. And so if you have a variant that is not very common, you're going to have a low attributable risk. Familial hypercholesterolemia, that variant is very, very rare, and yet it opened the doorway to, to lipid lowering, and, and we're hoping to find other genes very much like that. So, so I think, you know, we shouldn't sort of, you know, throw up our hands and say, gosh, it's only 0.5% of the, of the variants of, of diabetes in, in this population or other populations, because really what we're looking for is clues to pathophysiology. And I, thought, I think part of the reaction that many of you are having is the idea that when you're writing a story for somebody, of course, you realize that as we, as all of us do, that most people are narcissistic. And when you write the story, they want to know, gee, I've got diabetes, or it's in my family, they've just found these new genes, so what does it mean for me? And it's a longer story to talk about it in terms of the public health kind of sense and understand the biology of disease is different from saying, you know, this is the particular personalized medicine kind of impact of it.